The following recording is a program of the World War I Historical Association. This special ongoing series commemorates the centennial of the First World War. This is Dana Lombardi for the World War I Historical Association. On October 2nd and 3rd of 2015, a collaboration symposium was held between the WW1HA and the League of World War I Aviation Historians. This series presents the seminars offered at that symposium. The course of the war on the Western Front uh, in 1915 was determined by three major factors. Uh, the nature of the terrain on which the war was going to be fought, events in late 1914, and a series of fatal miscalculations. Uh, all three have been systematically ignored by historians. Uh, well, as Huxley once observed, uh, just because a fact is ignored doesn't mean that it isn't still a fact. Uh, the, the story of the Western Front in 1915, and well into 1916, is basically the, the story of the French Army. Uh, on the Allied side. And that's because, basically, uh, at the end of 1914, the British Expeditionary Force, which had originally been about 125,000 men, had essentially been wiped out. Uh, there were roughly 100,000 casualties by December. Uh, four out of ten were dead or missing. Uh, Great Britain had to rebuild, build a completely new army, which they started doing. By January 1915, there were uh, about a quarter of a million British soldiers in France. They occupied a very small section of the Western Front, about originally about 40 kilometers or 5%. Uh, what was left of the Belgian Army occupied uh, about 20 kilometers. So uh, by six, within six months, the British Expeditionary Force was over half a million men and they occupied about 60 kilometers of the front, or about 8%, okay? Uh, the Belgians uh, occupied about half of that. Uh, as a result, the French were largely on their own. Uh, the section of the front the British were, and the Belgians were occupying was really just too small to have much of an impact on the war, uh, and the forces were really too, too feeble the uh, French, in fact, were so concerned about this that they had 14 divisions uh, and behind the British or on the British and Belgian lines uh, to prevent German breakthroughs. <clears throat> now, at the end of 1914, Joffre, the French commander-in-chief, brimming with confidence, uh, had been given powers unprecedented in recent French history, uh, was enthusiastic about beginning a series of offensives that would uh, eventually drive the Germans out of France. In order to understand what those offensives were and how they operated, you really have to understand something about the geography and terrain of the Western Front. Uh, after, and it gets complicated for two reasons. One is, after the revolution, uh, the country was re-chopped up. All the old historic divisions were trashed, and the country was divided into departments. Uh, those are the one, same ones that are used today. The historic regions that were only basically retained for tourists, for tourism, and on wine labels. Uh, very important, by the way. That's, that's, that's good news. Okay. Uh, but during the war, the French army used those same designations, or more properly, they misused them. Uh, so, to designate various sections of the Western Front. 
the strategic center of the front was a 200 kilometer more or less swath of territory uh, which comprised historic Lorraine, which was not originally a part of France at all. Uh, it was the largest and by far the most important section of the front because it was the direct route for a German invasion of France and since it was the only part that was really contiguous with Germany, uh, it was the basic route for an invasion of Germany by the French army. Lorraine was so big that in fact it was divided, the army referred to it by its separate subdivisions. That was, that was also propaganda since at, once the war started, one of the claims was that Lorraine had been overrun, had been occupied by the Germans in 1871. Actually, they only had about a little chunk of it up at the very top, but this was an inconvenient admission, so the army spoke of it. Uh, they subdivided it, and the divisions are actually pretty sensible. The, the rugged area between the Meuse Valley and Champagne on the west uh, was the Argonne Forest, which was basically just the southern extension of the great forest that ran up into Belgium, the Ardennes. Same trees, just a different name. Okay. Uh, the flatter portion between the Meuse and the Mosul rivers uh, was called, was known historically as the Wavre, which is a, an old French word that means wet. Okay. Uh, particularly the southern part, which was where most of the fighting was going to have to take place. Uh, it's a characteristic of both of those components of the front in Lorraine that they were dominated by flat topped low hills of about 300, 400 meters, uh, which the French called buttes because they had flat tops. Okay. Uh, the section of the valley, the Meuse River Valley in central Lorraine, uh, was called simply the Heights of the Meuse even though there were other places where there were heights. But the French called this, these particular set of, this particular set of heights was the heights of the Muse. Okay. Uh, well, hey, it's France. Break the uh, Now, Eastern Lorraine had a very sharply defined limit. Uh, the Vosges Mountains, which were the delineating point between, uh, had always been historical, between Lorraine and Alsace, uh, which now, of course, for 50, nearly 50 years had been German-occupied in German territory. Uh, Alsace had historically, from Roman times, been divided into a northern and southern half, uh, as it still is today. Most of the fight, all the fighting, basically, in World War I was in the southern half, uh, which was, and it was up in the mountains, in the Vosges, so the French re typically just referred to that as the Vosges even though they were really only talking about a, a reasonably small chunk of it. Okay. Alsace, like Lorraine, was historically not part of, of France Profonde, which is a, a not an unimportant detail to, to consider uh, in terms of what happened next. Now, from Lorraine on up to the channel, it's very confusing. Uh, this, the immediate section of the front to the west of Argonne is Champagne. So pretend. Champagne. Uh, uh, today it's called Champagne Ardennes because the department that was right up on the border was actually Ardennes, not to be confused with the Belgian forest. <laughs> okay. Uh, but by January 1915, that was all in German hands. So the front was actually in Champagne proper. Okay. Uh, after Lorraine, that's really the largest of the, of the regions. Distinctly different geography, the rugged forests of the Argonne sort of flatten out. We get undulating fields uh, all through Champagne, and then we sort of merge into Picardy, okay, uh, which was not as large as Champagne. It was sort of more in the interior, but in the war, there in the front, there was originally a chunk of Picardy that was actually in the, on the front. The next section was the smallest by far, about a fifth the size of Lorraine. That's County Artois. Uh, 
which wasn't a region at all. It was a medieval jurisdiction. Uh, Artois stretched all along the border with Belgium. Now, for some reason, probably for propaganda reasons, when the French army talked about uh, the war and released communiques, they basically disappeared Picardy and only talked about Artois and Champagne. Uh, probably because they didn't want people to realize how far the Germans had penetrated into France, since Picardy is pretty is well into the interior. Um, they also, however, had a, a fairly sound reason for using these designations, because each one referred to, to a completely different set of, of conditions. Uh, Artois is really comprised of very fertile, glutinous soil. It's prone to flooding. Uh, it's intersected by rivers and streams that historic, basically were running parallel to the front, which was one of the problems with its strategic importance. Uh, Champagne is basically chalky, undulating country with low ridges, very well drained and dry. Uh, the Argonne, by 1914, was basically, uh, had basically been reduced to that which was totally uncultivatable, uh, very rugged forested terrain. Okay. The Wavre Plain was <coughs> wet in the south. If you draw a line between straight line from Verdun to Metz, uh, the dry parts on the north, the wet parts on the south, the southern side of it. Okay. The Vosges was very tough. We we tend to ignore, I think, just how rugged and jagged the Vosges Mountains really are. Uh, the differences in terrain and their proximity to the Meuse River Valley really dictated what was going to happen in the war. Uh, now the French were very much aware that the Meuse River Valley was the road into France. Okay? Uh, so at the natural choke point, which on the heights of the Meuse, they fortified the whole area intensively. By 1914, it was probably the most heavily fortified area in the world. Uh, the fortification centered on the town, the small city of Verdun, and so when the army talked about Verdun, they weren't talking about the town, which was militarily worthless. It's in a bowl, basically. Uh, they were really talking about this massive complex of fortifications. There were 30, 34 major forts, uh, the circumference was about, depending on who's counting and when, uh, but you know about a 150 kilometer chunk of the front. Okay, a semicircle that's about 290, 300 degrees almost. Uh, matter of size, the Verdun front was probably was half again as big as Artois. Okay. The front of Lorraine was probably as big, was as big as Artois and Champagne both put together. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, now that you're thoroughly confused about French geography, because you missed that obligatory course in the fifth grade that all French children take. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, in order to understand where Joffrey was going and what the general staff was planning. There are two things that, again, that get routinely passed over that are very important in determining what happened next. Uh, it's almost universally said that after the Battle of the Marne, uh, the Germans went on to the defensive and stayed there for years in the West. Uh, that's not true, actually. Uh, in October 1914, they gobbled up uh, the rest of Belgium onto Antwerp and the Channel ports, thus giving their relatively short-term submarine, short, you know, mission submarine fleet access to the Atlantic and the North Sea. Uh, in late September, there was a massive two-pronged offensive on both sides of Verdun, uh, aimed at encircling the town, which was what they, they had tried to do in August. On the left bank, the offensive occupied uh, more ground, including 
an important landmark, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. On the right bank, uh, the Bavarians, who were doing the fighting, gobbled up an enormous chunk of real estate. <clears throat> it was probably the largest single territorial gain of the First World War on the Western Front, uh, subsequently known to Americans as the Samuel Say salient. Uh, they thus threatened to break into the interior of France <clears throat> to outflank the forts, and which they now had cut off the main rail lines into. Conversely, if the French were going to carry the attack into Germany, they had to move up through this new German position that had just been created. That's exactly what Joffrey decided to do. Belatedly, the general staff in Paris and Chaté decide, realized that uh, where the, what the Germans had grabbed and its importance and decided to mount two major offensives to deal with the problem. I say belatedly because they'd already started in December uh, two offensives which were known in the, to the army as First Artois and First Champagne. It's kind of ominous when they start giving them numbers. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, but uh, First Artois didn't work out very well for the French. Uh, they lost 75,000 men killed and missing to the Germans, 25,000 roughly. Uh, the fighting was still going on uh, when the high command began its next two offensives in February 1915. Uh, the, those two offensives were supposed to be coordinated. As it happened, they both broke down and merged into other offensives, and so it's easy to see them as being separate. But actually, they were supposed to happen at the same time. Uh, first Artois, had only involved about a 20, 25 kilometer section of the front. It was very small. Uh, Joffre, who isn't, wasn't nearly as stupid as, as some people thought he was, realized that if you were going to succeed in breaking through, you had to break through on a much larger scale. You had to use a bigger hammer, in other words. Uh, so accordingly, these two offensives were planned uh, to be on a much larger scale. And they actually were. The problem the French had was that in order to, for those offensives to have any real chance of success, there were a couple of strong points that they had to reduce first. Uh, on the left bank, there was a butte called the Vauquois, which gave French artillery spotters a fine commanding view not only of the rail line, which they had cut, but also of any advances up the left bank. On the right bank, there was a larger and higher, it's 346 meters high, butte called Les Apparges, which effectively allowed the French gunners to, the German gunners, to control the most logical route into the dry part of the war, okay, and thence into Germany. Now, everybody talks about, and the French, nobody else talks about this, but the, the French historians all, all talk about these things as though they're like, widely separated places, but that's not true. If you stand on the Vauquois, and then they bothered to cut some of the trees down, you can see directly across the river with the naked eye to the, the ossuary of, that dominates the right bank. In fact, it's about 25 kilometers from the peak, from the, what's left of the Vauquois, over to the fort of Duamont. If you turn this way, it's only about 12, 10 or 10 kilom 10 or 12 kilometers to the westernmost position of the fortification rank, the, the ancient Post de Bruyere. From Les Apparges, you can't see it anymore because of the trees, but you're really only 10 kilometers to the south of the southernmost, southeasternmost forts. The fact that you're 10 kilometers to the south of the forts pretty much tells you the problem the French were facing. Okay. They had another problem. The only modern weapon, artillery gun, in the French arsenal was the 75, which is a first-rate gun. Fast, accurate, okay. hydraulic re air recoil, so it was very accurate. It had a fairly flat trajectory of fire. It was, in fact, absolutely the wrong gun for 
the terrain that the French were now planning to fight over. The rest of the French artillery park consisted of, I'm not making this up guys, seriously, it consisted of mechanical recoil weapons from 1878, okay? With a, with a few that were like more recent in the 1880s, okay, they had rel still had fairly low angles of fire, okay, and they were mechanical recoil weapons. So you know, the the question of accuracy with a mechanical recoil weapon, if you're engaged in indirect fire, it's it's just a non sequitur. I mean, you know, it's a contradiction in terms, okay, uh, but that's all they had. <clears throat> And they had another problem. Uh, before the war, the French had imported all their raw materials for high explosives from the Germans. Uh, that really didn't work out too well once the war started. Uh, France was unable, didn't have the raw materials to produce this stuff, so they were getting it all from the United States. Uh, but it took time, and, and actually in September 1914, uh, the French were basically out of high explosives. So the infantry, was going to get the job of taking all these places without any real artillery support. I mean, you know, a few shells, we, we have accounts from survivors, you know, they would be sitting there and they're ready to go up. They've been told there would be an artillery barrage and it would be like, this is it? <laughs> okay. Uh, not surprisingly, they were promptly massacred. Uh, Les Apparges really set the template for what was going to happen throughout a lot of the war. Uh, the, one of the survivors who was a really brilliant young man, novelist, Maurice Genevois, who was there and survived Les Apparges, wrote his account of it was called very simply, La Mort, the death. Uh, another officer spoke of tromping on nothing but human remains in the French trenches. In the futile struggle to take this one minor strong point on the right bank, the French lost 30,000 men, including uh, the, the wounded. Uh, the army later whittled that down considerably to slightly under 20,000. Uh, the attempt to, to take the Vauquois meant a similar fate. The only difference was there were fewer casualties because it was a smaller view. Uh, undeterred by this disaster and what it portended, uh, the French went ahead with their plan for a massive right bank offensive. Uh, this was going to be bigger. He had seven army corps. Okay, uh, we're going to attack on a 100 kilometer L-shaped section of the front in Louvre. The idea was the attack on one wing succeeded, it would collapse in on the other and trap the Germans. Uh, to this attack, France devoted, the French devoted, a third of their heavy artillery, of all the heavy artillery they had on the Western Front. Uh, this was the first really grand scale French offensive, started in the first part of April. There were, it was carried out, here's another ominous parallel, with a sublime regard for the terrain, for secrecy, and for they now demonstrated enemy superiority and firepower. Uh, after three successive attempts, the French gave up. A secret report to the war cabinet estimated their losses at 123,000 men. The Wolver, coupled with Les Apparges, was probably the worst French military disaster of the First World War. If you're wondering why you've never heard about it, okay, the French promptly disappeared it into the memory hole, uh, which was pretty much what, what, how the war was conducted. Uh, this was a variation of the same trick they had used with the Marne, which was actually four separate engagements stretching over a 200 kilometer section of the front. None of the engagements were particularly near the Marne River, by the way. Um, sort of like if Abraham Lincoln had taken Vicksburg and Gettysburg, both happened the same month, lumped them together and called it the Battle of Kentucky. Uh, but it was, but it was a great public relations, it was a great public relations. The problem was, the French actually started believing their own PR. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this debacle on the right bank through the left bank offensive is totally out of whack because <clears throat> Joffrey wanted to try he, he, another offensive. He felt that the Wolver had so weakened the, the Germans that there was a chance that they could break through an Artois. So a second Artois started in May. 
that didn't work out particularly well. Uh, but for these this period, Allied losses for March, April, May, and June came to about a quarter of a million men dead or missing. German figure was 95,000. Never deterred by a few dead infantry, uh, Joffre's staff planned for the long delayed attack in the Argonne, which now is going to begin in July and July. Uh, the army needed time to reposition its heavy guns and to replenish its depleted stock of shells, which all came from the United States. Uh, everyone in Paris, by the way, knew about the operation in the Argonne, just like they had in the Wolverine, uh, and so did the German commander there, who was a middle-aged, well, he looks pretty young to me, he was only 65, but uh, <laughs> he was an engineering officer. He struck first, and by September, uh, he had basically chewed his way through the Argonne it was on the south side of the forest, about to break out into the clear. Uh, French losses in July and August, mostly for fighting in the Argonne, were nearly 70,000. German losses well under 20. Uh, the, the French really realized the importance, I think, for the first time of, of what was going on in the Argonne. Uh, this was one of the very few times in 1915, or really the very few times, period, when a French general commanding commanding army was basically fired uh, for failure. Usually that didn't happen. Uh, Sorail was, Joffrey got rid of Sorail. He shunted him off to Greece where he promptly embarrassed himself. Uh, it was this theater in 1915 that led the president of France to record uh, a depressing sequence of interviews. Depressing is an understatement uh, with the army which tells you really everything you need to know about what was going on. Uh, when he went to general headquarters, they told him and asked, how are things going in the Argonne? They said, everything is going great, fine. He went down to the army group and they said, well, there's progress, but it's going pretty slow. Lee. He went down to Corps, where they were actually doing the fighting, and here the commanding general tells me, we're losing 100 meters a month, the Germans are devouring us, the letters from the soldiers are deeply discouraged. Nice, complete 180 degree inversion. Undeterred, another big offensive was planned in Champagne for September 1915. Uh, that failed as well. Uh, its only real effect was it stalled the Argonne offensive as the German Fifth Army had to shift everything they had over into Champagne to, to uh, fight the, the French and the British. Uh, French losses for the period September, November 1915, oh, well over 150,000. Um, we're talking dead and missing. Uh, German losses under 70. Now the Germans kept on mounting minor offensive operations in the war for all through the summer, but by the end of Second Champagne, the French were basically out of gas. <clears throat> uh, the year came to a bloody end with a series of minor disasters in the Vosges where the French Alpine troops, who were the cream of French infantry, were trying to seize German strong points there. Uh, in terms of numbers or anything, those, offend, those operations were trivial, uh, but they had a great importance out of, out of, you know, disproportionate importance because, uh, A, of the new tactics, but also because this, these guys really were the best the second best that the, the French had to offer. They'd already lost their best troops, uh, the, the, well, the equivalent of the French equivalent of the Marines, the Infanterie Coloniale. They'd all been killed off at Rossignol in Belgium in, in 1914. Uh, so the, the Alpine troops were the next best group, and by the end of December they had lost 22,000 of them, which was pretty much finished the, the force. Uh, to sum up, the first 16 months of the war, the Allies lost in dead and missing at least 1.1 million men. The Germans a little over 400,000. And I said at least the French retroactively subtracted out the live returned prisoners of war from their figures, which the Germans couldn't do because there was no Germany after the war. Uh, so actually, if you added those prisoners in, since they were lost to the war effort, the figure for the first 16 months was closer to two million. Uh, now by now, Joffrey had come to the conclusion that 
Well, you really had to have a bigger hammer, and he was going to have to go to the Brits to get that. His estimate, which was correct, was that by July 1916, uh, the, there would be one and a half million British troops in France, and so he would have enough men to mount a major offensive that would basically cause a hemorrhage in the German positions because he was convinced they were just hanging on by their toenails. Uh, and he did understand, by the way, that his, the French army was getting weaker. There were actually fewer soldiers on the Western Front at the end of 1915 than there had been at the start. Okay? What he didn't realize was that there were 750,000 more German soldiers on the Western Front at the end of 1915 than there had been at the end of 1914. Okay. He had it backwards. A secret report to the War Cabinet, to give it its convenient short English name, that's not what it was called. Uh, it was the secret committee of the chamber in charge of trying to find out what was going on in the war. Uh, <laughs> basically, I mean, that's what it was. Uh, gave some of the reasons why the French attacks were all failures. German defensive positions were constructed in depth, relied on strong points and infantry shelters constructed of concrete. When the preparatory bombardment began, they simply abandoned their forward, forward positions, waited in the ones behind. Uh, the author of that report was, uh, was an army captain who had actually been in combat there. Uh, he concluded by personal anecdote, with a personal anecdote, his company of 250 men actually reached the first German trench line, where they found exactly one dead German soldier. He only had 20 men left at that point. He concluded with a horrifying prophecy. At this rate, there won't be any French infantry left to carry on the war. But back at French headquarters, the high command saw it differently. Taking, however, briefly, the first line of trenches was counted as a victory, as though the object of these attacks was to score points, like a football game. Uh, they applied the same reasoning to uh, the brief seizure of a toehold on, on a strong point or a view. Uh, it was, as one French senior commander remarked, contemptuously, a war for the com victory for the communique. These were not victories that had any military. They weren't even victories, but they had no military significance whatsoever. Three observations about what was basically a really horrible year for the Allies, not just on the Western Front. Okay. Uh, first, okay, and I'll get back to this more later, but the Allies totally missed the boat on German losses. At the start of the war, the French had decided that since the Germans were attacking, they, de by definition, had to have higher casualties. So they basically took their casualties and, gave, and came up with German casualties as multiples of that. Uh, by January 1915, they were convinced that Germany was running out of men. <laughs> okay? And they told everybody that. You could read it in the New York Times. Uh, but they all, the London cabinet, Kitch Kitchener told the London cabinet, he had reports from the French general staff, uh, the Germans were going to have to end the war very shortly because they would be out of soldiers. Everything that happened subsequent to that, after that, was tailored to fit this mean. For example, early on in 1915, the, the Germans dropped the old square division of four regiments and two brigades. They got rid of brigades, they got rid of one of the regiments. In fact, they were really moving kind of awkwardly and hesitantly towards making the battalion the real combat unit. Uh, so the French looked at this and decided, ah, this is confirmation that their, their manpower is dwindling. The, French, the Germans were basically replacing riflemen with machine gunners. <laughs> they were replacing their relatively crappy field gun with 10.5 centimeter howitzers. Uh, they were integrating more and more firepower. So yeah, the divisions were smaller, but they were more powerful. And of course, now they had more of them. Okay. They were also decentralizing, i.e. German commanders were being low-level German commanders 
were being given a lot more responsibility for making local decisions, the Allies were going the other way. But the French simply missed it. Second, okay, the French convinced that they were just killing Germans in heaps, completely failed to grasp the steady development of German tactics, and the tactics that enabled them to mount continuous attacks while inflicting nearly three times the losses on the enemy that they were sustaining. Uh, those attacks were two different kinds depending on the terrain. In the Argonne, the, the Germans would pick a small section of the, of the trench and they would simply obliterate it with high explosives. So the infantry would walk in very cautiously and round up the survivors and advance the lines. <coughs> in the Vosges, you couldn't do that because of the mountainous conditions. The F Germans adopted a much different approach uh, which gradually spread and, and this was all under the Fifth Army jurisdiction so they began to meld these. Uh, in the Vosges, they, they started experimenting <coughs> with what we would call mixed arms units consisting of the combat engineers who in the German army actually fought uh, and luck out of their arm. I mean, those, those combat engineers were the guys who ran, who had mortars, uh, and later on, at the end of 1950, flamethrowers. Uh, so you had a mixed unit, an outtailing that had combat engineers, regular soldiers, machine gunners, and, and Jaeger, the, 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 the French, the German equivalent of the chasseur. Those were the elite troops. Uh, they were preferred weapons were machine guns, mortars, and hand grenades. Okay, there wasn't much going on with rifles. The world rifles in World War One were very, very useful. If you had, if a guy got wounded, you could make a litter with two two guys holding their rifles, and the guy could sit on it, and, and they could take him to the rear. Okay, I'm serious. The Germans eventually had already stopped. We're shortly going to stop. They didn't even make infantry rifles anymore. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> those tactics enabled the, the uh, Germans to sort of take trenches from the sides and sort of bomb their way down them using using their weapons. Uh, and they would then call on portable portable artillery support using the mortars. Uh, the German combat engineers had mortars in 15, um, well, 17.5 and 25 centimeters, which one French survivor likened as having someone throw a satchel of dynamite at you. Okay, uh, so and the French, by the way, and the British didn't didn't have anything in that class at all. Uh, those were new tactics, and the French were missing their developments because uh, they were convinced. They had nothing to learn because they were doing so well. Now, when I try to point these things out historically, okay, I get accused of Germanophilia, which is one not unsympathetic reader told me, it's like pedophilia, only worse. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that being said, what a lot of people miss because they're so outraged at how could I say bad things about the, the British Army. Uh, you know, a great deal of German success in the First World War was due to, to Allied blunders, and, and the blunders are of such magnitude that, that you can hardly believe that they happened. Uh, uh, just a few things about the British Expeditionary Force. Uh, the, the, the whole calculations years before the war that led the British to agree to the idea that landing 100,000 men in France uh, in a war in which both armies were expected to deploy two million men on each side, that this would have a decisive impact on, on the battle. Uh, is, it only has three explanations. Okay? You don't believe that you're going to be called on it. Okay? You're totally incompetent. Or you have this insane confidence in, in your national qualities. Uh, once the fighting started, there's, there's plenty of evidence to suggest, when well, you can pick your choice, but for example, in a war that was from the very get-go, okay, eight, August 1914, was marked by high, the importance of high explosives on the battlefield. Uh, 
the British are still priding themselves on volleys of rifle fire. Uh, British gunners came to France with only shrapnel shells. Okay, everybody started this war making all kinds of mistakes. Okay, because they hadn't fought one for years. I mean, in order to have any had any command experience in the previous European war in the West, you basically had to be in the 80s. You know, uh, and some generals were, by the way. Okay, uh, the German general in the Argonne, who von Hessler, who was an octogenarian. He went along with the new commander, who was this young fellow of 65, just to make sure that he didn't screw anything up. <laughs> okay. But uh, <clears throat> in a war in which, but the, the British gunners were still insisting that uh, shrapnel shells could cut barbed wire, well, all the way through 1950. Uh, in a war where the infantry rarely ever saw an, a, an alive enemy soldier if they made it through the trenches. Uh, they're practicing bayonet practice. Uh, edged weapons, by the way, wounds were so rare in the First World War, the German Medical Service didn't even keep track of them. Uh, which the American Surgeon General after the Civil War said the same thing, by the way. There's nothing new there. Uh, British soldiers were, were tough. They were stoic. They were courageous. They were, as the saying goes, lions led by jackasses. Uh, saying, by the way, that goes back to the Crimea. It was not. It was not something unique to 1914. Now, the French disease was worse and it was different. Okay. It's sometimes said erroneously that the French problem was a commitment to the offense, and that's why their casualties were so heavy. There, were, the French French doctrine was basically a function of what French officer you talked to. Uh, there was no real coherent doctrine. Uh, at all. And, but in fairness, you have to realize, if you're really convinced that your enemy is on the ropes, he's outnumbered, he's exhausted, he has no reserves, the idea of frontal infantry assaults is not all that stupid an idea. As, as General Grant once remarked, sometimes you just have to go out and whip him. Okay? Uh, if you're a good general, you know when that moment has come. Uh, if you're a bad general, you don't. Okay. This failure, however, was not just an intelligence failure. I don't stress that. Uh, intelligence people are always being routinely disregarded. Okay? Uh, it was a systemic failure in France. The famous French historian of the Ancien Regime had observed that since the drawing room wished to believe all was well, all was well. The French general staff, the product of decades of pruning and purging so it was purely Republican, was in this regard as complacently oblivious as the aristocrats of 1789. Then there was the failure to understand the dramatic change in warfare. Both well, explosives as opposed to bullets. Okay. But the real problem here is the really mind-boggling one is what we might just call military common sense. The, the, the French infantry who were garrisoning the Vauquois in 1914, just walked away from it. Why? Because nobody told them it was important. <laughs> it was like, for people in Paris, you know, 200, a 200 meter butte was an insignificant obstacle. For the local commander down on the ground looking up at 200 meters at a 60 degree or 45 degree angle, it was impregnable. Okay? When the Germans grabbed the Vauquois, their artillery spotters promptly called in artillery fire on the railroad, on the railroad line. Railroads can't move around, so they make good targets for gunners. And here comes the part that just blows your mind. And I spent a long time, I would just go over there, sit on the car and looking at this and asking myself the obvious question, why the hell didn't they move the rail line? Okay? I mean, the German guns had all they could figure out what the range was, okay? They didn't. That line was cut all the way through the war, okay? I was sort of delighted in a grimly amusing way that I finally found a French officer who was talking about how the, all the problems in command, and he, that was the example he used. It was like, gee, why didn't they just move the rail line about, you know, three kilometers to the south? He said his conclusion was, that tells you all you need to know. Okay. 
Now, it's tempting at this point to talk about stupidity, this everybody was stupid. That's not true. Uh, he pointed out, you know, the intelligence estimates that were done about how unsuccessful all of this bombing was. There were, there were officers who knew exactly what was going on. They saw the problems and they, they saw solutions, okay? Uh, in, both res in both countries, the response of the senior generals was uniformly the same. They would tell the civilians, you people know nothing about modern warfare, about warfare. You're not professionals. And then they would feed them a kind of soothing diet of, of fake successes. After uh, the war, long after the war, Lloyd George, who became prime minister in 1916, uh, had a really kind of sarcastic and brilliant summary of that, in which he said, you know, defeats were turned into checks, there were imaginary victories, everything was going fine, and above all, we're just killing them in heaps, so you just, we just have to keep them going. Okay? Um, <clears throat> they really believed that, and I think that's the hardest thing. We're, we're conditioned to think it was cynical ploy. Joffrey told the president of France in 1915, that he would have the Germans out of France in six months. Herbillon, who was his liaison officer, practically had a stroke. He was in a room. He practically had a stroke. <laughs> it was like, what are you going to do? How, how is it proposed? I mean, sublime confidence. Okay. Uh, anyone who objected was therefore attacked. Okay. Uh, they didn't really know. That you don't have all the secrets. You don't really know what's going on. Uh, and to a surprising extent, the British and French civilian governments, despite their misgivings, which started early on, by the way, uh, the hanky in the war cabinet in London realized it was a naval officer. When the Germans grabbed the channel ports in Antwerp, he realized, this is not good, <laughs> you know? Uh, but they both shared this common view about outsiders who, who were criticizing things. Um, the British government never really seriously considered letting the colonial officers, who had the best troops and the most combat experience, uh, have any say in what the, in the, what the army was doing. Uh, in their way, they were just as snobbish about the Australians and the Canadians as the army was, as the regular British army was. Uh, a snobbishness that, of course, carried over to the Americans. Uh, in Paris, the same disdain existed, but it was, it was on a different fault. It was true of anyone who was suspected of not being either sufficiently Republican or, in some cases, too Republican. <laughs> okay, you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. There had been a careful series of attempts to get rid of all these people from the high command positions in the Army. A real purge, and which was basically aimed not just at monarchists. There were supposedly still monarchists running around in France in 1905, uh, but more ominously Roman Catholics, who were thought to be highly suspect and not proper Republicans. Uh, and as one French writer observed later, alas, Republicanism was no guarantee of competence. Okay. Uh, what made it worse was that many of these officers who had been ostracized persecuted, suffered before the war, once the war started, became indispensable. Okay. They returned the favor with interest. Okay. Uh, it was Pétain who was the most successful French senior general of the war, one of the most successful Allied general period, probably. He was the only one who actually understood how modern warfare. Um, it was Pétain who told the president of France, he said, you of all men should understand this country is neither led nor governed. Okay. That's a perfect epitaph for the Third Republic. It was definitely true of what was going on in, in, in France at the time. It didn't exactly endear him to the, to the government. Uh, and he was already in a lot of trouble with, uh, with the other people in the army. Uh, so yeah, there were people who knew they were Slandered, cast aside, not given any, not given a hearing. Okay, so but they weren't stupid. Okay, um, 
having said that, I want to add something. That there were problems on the German side. Um, but that those problems, are, which are very important to understand and, and not well understood, I think, are very important to understand. That's a story for 1960, not 1950. So if we, so I'm just confining myself to 1950. Okay, a little part of 1914. Thank you. Please. Once the stalemate of the Western Front started, was there any reflection on the experiences in the American Civil War in uh, 1864, 1865, and their trench warfare situation? Um, well, as far as the, as far as the, uh, as far as the Germans were concerned, it wasn't the stalemate was to their advantage. Uh, so, and so far as it was, a, it was a stalemate, yeah, they were aware of that. Although I have to say, if you look at the Civil War for, you know, system and then you look at what the Germans were doing in, in the, on their side of the front, uh, not a lot of comparisons, basically. Um, the English basically, you know, the high command, the English, the English high command just discounted anything you know, that hadn't immediately happened to them. Um, the, the problem with the French side, they thought, they really thought through most of 1915 that, that they were going to break the stalemate. I mean, I, I think the thing we don't realize is when Joffrey told uh, Poincaré he was going to have the Germans out of France in six months, he was not just talking through his nose. He really believed that. He, he said that he was convinced that was the case. So they didn't really, it didn't really register at the command level. The lower levels, uh, yeah, sure, there were French officers who, and some British officers who, who knew, but nobody paid any attention to them, basically. Okay. It didn't apply to them. Yeah, it didn't apply to us because we're, you know, the great 20th century disease. It's like Lenin. It's like I know better, you know, the commune was a failure because they didn't, weren't violent enough, of course, so we'll get violent and then we'll complain when they exterminate us because, you know, we brought a knife to the gunfight. Okay, that's the same, that's the same mentality. Yeah. Sir, uh, in your opinion, uh, does any uh, commander emerge during 1915 yet as, in your opinion, uh, brilliant, other than uh, one of Forbeck and Boyanovich? Well, I think the terms of I think the terms of brilliance really changed. I mean, you know, if I were press, I mean, yeah, yeah. The Civil American Civil War is really the last civil war when you've got generals who are basically running their own campaigns. I mean, Grant's sitting under a tree writing his orders. His, his, staff, his staff people are just messengers, okay? Uh, that was true of Lee as well, okay? Uh, by the time we get to 1817, Von Malky uh, didn't even, I mean, Von Malky had a whole elaborate staff that basically ran everything for him. That's because it got much more complicated. On the other hand, what it means is if you're totally inept, your staff can basically cover for you, okay? Uh, or, or moreover, as, as a lot of French officers observed about Joffre, they can basically run, the, run what you're doing, which is what, what Joffre's problem was. His staff was basically calling most of the shots by herding them along. Uh, <coughs> that, that's the claim, okay? So I, I think it's different criteria, okay? Uh, the most successful commander in 1915 was uh, Paul von Mudra, the German commander in the Argonne. Okay, uh, the crown, the crown prince, who was technically in the charge of Fifth Army. Uh, the German command system, basically, it didn't. It, you know, it, it sort of precluded your taking an active micro role. Your your role was macro. Okay, so it, it, the whole name of the game really changed. I think. Uh, the problem the French had was there were some very good generals on their side, uh, but they got killed in action. The, the German general and the, the French general who fell in the defense of Hattenchatel, I think, was very was a really first-rate first rate guy. Uh, Drian, who got killed in 1916. Uh, you know, there was a kind of suicidal mood. If you, if you visit the, the uh, Austrian Army Museum, there's a wonderful portrait that was done of uh, Brosch von Aronau, who was uh, Franz uh, Ferdinand's chief of staff, leading uh, the Jaeger 
into combat at Rawaruska against the Russians. You look at that photograph, these are God, these are walking dead and they know it. Okay. They're 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 gonna die for their country and so you know, the you know, the idea that they're not just <laughs> didn't enter their minds at that point. See. So yeah, it's a short list. Almost by definition, people who survived were survived because they were not too good. <laughs> With all this uh, uh, French and British uh, confidence, might, uh, uh, it's surprising that uh, the Germans couldn't achieve a strategic breakthrough in 1915. Well, that gets into this problem that really came to a head in 1916. But you have to realize that the, 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 the German the German army it was there was a the Easterners and the Westerners. The French had chapels, is the French officer word for it. Which were there were about half a dozen of them, at least. Uh, the German army basically had Easterners versus Westerners. Okay? The Easterners were totally opposed to uh, the fighting, the offensive going on the offensive in the West. Uh, they were still aggravated about the fact that von Schlieffen had insisted that they move to the attack in the West. Uh, even though von Malky, the younger, totally changed the plan around and it was bore no resemblance to what, what von Schlieffen was talking about, uh, they were still bent out of shape. And von Hessler, the guy I mentioned, for example, swore to his dying day that that was the big mistake that Germany lost the war. They should have stayed on the offense, defend defense totally in, in, in the West and smashed everybody else in the dictated terms. Okay. Uh, as a result, they ended up fighting, and von Malky knew this, okay, uh, fighting a war on three fronts. Okay. When he read von Schlieffen's plans, his notes, his marginalia, there wasn't really much of a plan, uh, von Schlieffen was saying very didactically, there are the, about two fronts, von Malky wrote the margins, now, the question is, how basically three, how do we handle three fronts? He realized that was both the war, how the war was going to run. Uh, they never had enough manpower or firepower to manage all that. Okay. The, reason, the reason the Allies kept, kept being convinced, Italy will win the war for us. Okay. No, I didn't. Romania will win the war for us. Okay. Finally, somebody in the French cabinet did an, a report, and he said, the reason the Germans always seem to have a couple of hundred thousand men they can throw into any theater of where they're threatened, those are the couple of hundred thousand men that, that we never actually killed that we claimed we did. Okay, <laughs> you know, which really is, yeah. But yeah, they, they didn't have the, they did not have a strong enough force to mount all those. And gradually, through, uh, gradually the, the Easterners were basically doing everything they could to um, you know, get rid of the Westerners, and they finally prevailed. Okay, basically. I mean, when when von Hindenburg finally takes over, when 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 von Falkenhayn resigns, that's the triumph of the Easterners. Okay, so it's like screw the Western Front, we're going like, to beat, we're going to beat all these people, and they did. The Romanians, the Russians, and we moved to to the Italians, and then we're going to finish off you guys. Okay, uh, so. Husbanding your resources, yeah. Uh, the, but they never really thought about that. I mean, the answer to the question. I mean, in the West. Okay. Please. Did the British Navy's blockade of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of Germany have any effect in terms of supply for the German army? Did that have anything to do with them digging in and trying to hold rather than continue to? The, blo the blockade was a great success after November 1918. <laughs> it was. I mean, we. I mean, they, they, it was a clever propaganda. Okay, Nin November nineteen eighteen to June nineteen nineteen. Hundreds of thousands of Germans starved. That was all the, the terrible. Up until that point, no, not really. I mean, not. I mean, sure. I mean, you know, my. I, I, you know, they. They. Somebody said earlier they whined a lot about. I like the raid on Friday. They whined a lot about it, but no. I mean, when. When uh, Fayol, who was who was the other, who was really the best French general of the war in terms of low-level combat, when Fayol went into Germany in, in November after the armistice, hid his diary, which nobody ever saw until long after his death. His diary said, "This is not a defeated country." He said, "They'll be back at us again in ten years." Okay, uh, 
But yeah, the blockade. Yeah, I'd really come in you on if you if the enemy can't sh if your opponents can't shoot that shoot at you, you can pretty much do what you want. Okay. That by the way, the Harris when you get into air power, Harris later used those casualties to justify strategic bombing. You know, I let's just fly over the country and, and litter it with bombs. Okay, said so, well, it kills it kills less people than than the blockade. Any more questions, please? All right, thank you.